eMarketer field guides help marketers understand how key MarTech, AdTech, and commerce tech tools are changing so they can make smarter purchasing decisions. Sponsor one today to ensure your solution is top of mind for buyers. Visit eMarketer.com slash advertise to learn more. Hello, listeners. Today is Wednesday, September 25th. Welcome to Behind the Numbers, Reimagining Retail, an eMarketer podcast. This is the show where we talk about how retail collides with every part of our lives. I'm your host, Sarah Lebo. Today's episode topic is our September unofficial most interesting retailers of the month list. Before we jump into our top eight for September, let's meet today's guests. Joining me for today's episode, we have fellow committee member, retail podcast regular, Ariel Fager. Hi, Ariel. Hi, happy to be here. Happy to have you. Also happy to have with us another podcast regular, Zach Stambor. Welcome back, Zach. Yeah, thanks for having me back. And joining us on the podcast for the first time is our analyst, Rachel Wolf. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. So excited to have you. Okay. Let's jump in to our unofficial most interesting retailers of September list. Ariel, our colleague Becky and I make up the committee and we put together this list every month. So if you've listened before, you know the deal. These are the eight retailers we're watching because they're the most interesting. They're launching new initiatives, partnerships, overperforming in earnings. They have notable social media buzz, you name it. This list is hyper subjective, but it is supported with objective analysis. Ariel and I will present our list in the first half of the episode. And in the second half, Rachel and Zach will have opportunity to tell us where we went wrong. Okay, let's get started with number eight, JCPenney for launching an apparel line for women who use wheelchairs. These items are designed with zippers, pockets, fabrics, and waistband loops to be comfortable and functional for seated wearers, according to a press release. This is one of a few brands that have had similar accessible or adaptable lines come out recently. So it's not the most interesting thing, but I still think it's a decent move by JCPenney. Yeah, I think it's a it's an interesting move. I think anytime, you know, where we have retailers being inclusive, I am definitely in support. You know, I do wonder, you know, JCPenney is trying to mount a comeback. Um, so, uh, you know, I applaud any kind of way it's trying to differentiate itself from other department stores or retailers. Okay, moving on from that, number seven, J. Crew for reintroducing its physical catalog. Ariel, say more on this. Yeah, so as a child of the 90s, I definitely loved a catalog, loved to look through it. And I think it's really interesting that J. Crew's bringing this back. The catalog was discontinued in 2017. And I think like what they're trying to do is bring it back, but like with a more modern take. It's, you know, going to be designed to be less like product centered and more content interviews. I think in the inaugural issue, they've got a interview with Demi Moore on her collection, and it's going to have some QR codes that shoppers can use to kind of shop on their phones. So I think it's just a really interesting thing to kind of bring back something of the past, but update it. And I think a lot of people are looking for inspiration. So this is like a great way to get that inspiration on paper instead of online. I totally agree. I love this move. I think at a time when we're just bombarded with like digital stuff, digital content everywhere, having like a physical object and this physical object is on like thicker paper stock. (laughs) It's got like really vivid beautiful sort of images. It's designed to stick around and and sit on your coffee table. And Mm -hmm. that's pretty valuable if you can get people to just look at this and think of J. Crew all the time or whenever you're sitting down on your couch. When I say clothing catalog, what like brand do you think of? I mean, for me, J. Crew definitely is the first one that comes to mind. So uh, and I've noticed, move. yeah, I've noticed that I've been getting more catalogs from brands in the mail. So I think this could be, you know, the, I guess the tip of the iceberg in a way. I'm pretty sure that a lot of companies will be following suit. I think of Land's End. I think of back to school circling the Land's End catalog. I think of Delia's. That makes sense too. I wanted everything in the Delia's catalog. <laughs> All right. Number six, 
Levi's, which is launching a mobile tool for its in-store stylists. The app's purpose is to offer personalized recommendations, which will sync up with a customer's loyalty account. That's if they opt in. So it's sort of a clienteling tool. It's a tool for Levi's employees to better be able to serve their consumers in the store in a way that will hopefully also help them out out of the store in e-commerce. I think this is just a really smart way to empower store associates in a way that like actually enables them to know who it is that they're speaking to. Because so often you go into a store, you say one thing about what it is that you're looking for, and the the associate doesn't really know like anything about Mm. you. It may be completely irrelevant what they show you. This enables them to like really hone in on what it is that you're likely to want. It's like the tool that prevents you from doing like a Julia Roberts and Pretty Woman moment (laughs) because you know who that customer is. Yeah, and I think it fits in really well with their long-term ambitions, right, which is that they want people to go in for more than just a pair of jeans. Yeah. So then you have the stylist who says, oh, you know, this top will look great with that pair or Mm. this dress, this denim dress, not like the one I'm wearing now. But, you know, (laughs) like I think that it fits in really well with their long-term ambitions. That's a great point. Okay, number five. Old Navy for launching a vintage fashion line. While wow, we're doing a lot of these vintage brands, Ariel, say more. I know. I was just going to say we've really hit hit nostalgia yeah. a lot. <laughs> they have um, a lot of places where I can go buy jeans. <laughs> yeah. So Old Navy, they're celebrating their 30th anniversary as a brand, and uh, to celebrate that, they're kind of doing this whole campaign centered around uh, like a throwback line of clothing that's like kind of a uh, you know an Old Navy reimagined you know classic with a modern twist. I just think it's really fun. I think, you know, Old Navy's heyday was certainly back maybe in the 90s and early 2000s. So I I don't think it's a bad move to try to recapture some of that spirit. And I think this is just, again, we've talked on the pod before about Zach Posen, who is appointed creative director of Gap Inc. And I just think it's all part of their kind of turnaround plans. And I think it seems to be kind of forking. I think it's interesting, but I also wonder, you know, like everybody's doing 90s themed stuff these days, Mm. right? So I wonder if like that's really going to be the thing that makes Old Navy stand out from the crowd. I mean, that being said, I do think that it'll help with their overall turnaround and like Gap's broader reinvention. The clothes look to me like a 90s Tommy Hilfiger or a 90s Ralph Lauren. Maybe I'm off base here, but I don't think I am. It has this sort of Americana feel as well. It feels on the pulse, but you're right. The fact that I'm even saying that it's reminiscent of other brands does mean that it's a crowded space. Okay, number four. H&M, which is launching dedicated beauty shops alongside its flagship stores. H&M has already done this in Oslo, but that's been a success, so they're expanding to two other stores in Stockholm. Ultimately, that's still a pretty small space, but I wouldn't be surprised if H&M kept doing this. I think it's a huge vote of confidence for beauty, which we've talked about before, how successful beauty has been as a category. And I think it's a smart move from H&M since their beauty is known for being affordable. Absolutely. I think about Kohl's and their, you know, Sephora shop and shops. And, you know, I think it's just a great way to kind of get people to spend a little bit more, to shop a little bit more, to hang around the store a little bit more. And it like makes sense, you know, in terms of like the actual categories, beauty, clothing, it all kind of pulls together. But I think like going on that Kohl's, Sephora well, that you mentioned, I think that's also a risk for them, right? Which is that people will just go in and pick up a MAC lipstick and then walk out without having bought anything from H&M. So I think, you know, they have to find a balance there. Yeah, it's usually the clothes that get customers to come into H&M and then they pick up the lipstick on the way out. This is going for the opposite, trying to get folks to come in for the lipstick and getting them to go in next door and grab those clothes as well. Okay, number three, Big Lots, which despite declaring bankruptcy this month, also announced a new holiday sale. Ariel, what is happening here? 
Yeah, Big Lots is uh, having an interesting month. So yeah, they did announce Chapter 11 bankruptcy. And, you know, that's not something that we should uh, sweep to the side. But I do think it's really interesting that right on the heels of that, they announced this Black Friday weekly sales event. So every Thursday, they're going to announce like a special deal that customers can shop on Fridays. Um, And that's going to take place um, every Friday now through December. I think it might be, you know, kind of a last grasp at something, but I I just think, you know, at least they're, they're going down swinging if they're going to go down. Yeah. I, I don't know, man. Uh, Like a month where you declare bankruptcy doesn't seem like the month to uh, be on the list of the most interesting retailers. (laughs) I understand the push to pull the holiday season forward even into September, which seems kind of crazy to me. But they're not alone in doing that. I mean, Best Buy is also launching their holiday sale for members of their paid membership programs at the very end of this month. And so, I don't know, it, it doesn't strike me as like super interesting. And given that they declared bankruptcy, I don't know. Fair point. Yeah. Is it like one deal per week? Is that the idea? Yes. Or it's I just like so. a one day deal. That's kind of interesting to it's, me. It's a one day themed array of deals, isn't it? Oh, good question. Well, so that is interesting to me. Like cutting down on choice is interesting to me. I've been looking at the site called med.com, which offers one deal on one product per day. I think consumers are interested in like being told what the one thing is that they can get a deal on. And that's kind of fascinating. But yeah, I mean, fair point, Zach. And I think you'll get your chance to duke that one out (laughs) in the second half. Yeah, we'll revisit this one. Number two, Amazon. We're into the big guy here. For adding ads to its AI search bot, Rufus, and for opening some new fresh supermarkets. Okay, so let's break this up. The ads, that's interesting. They sort of quietly added ads to its chatbot. This is something we're looking at a lot on our marketing side. That's a plug for our eMarketer Daily newsletter if you're not signed up. But Yeah, this is a place that we're going to be seeing ads more and more often. And so I'm engaged in how Amazon is going to monetize this tool. Fresh supermarkets are fascinating because Amazon closed several of these last year and now they're leaning back into it. Grocery in person is not something that Amazon's been able to get right. Clearly, if they're opening these supermarkets, they have money to burn on trying to get it right. So fascinating to see if this actually works this time. The Rufus ads, I think, are tremendously interesting. I mean, Gen AI and chatbots is just not a space that we've seen ads yet. And to see Mm -hmm. Amazon waste really like no time at all weaving ads into it, I think is very notable and a clear sign that they see this as the way in which consumers are going to shop Amazon going forward. Yeah, this happened during a week where Perplexity also announced ads in its search bot. Perplexity is a Gen AI search tool, but it has a much smaller user base than Amazon. It's kind of like a startup y search tool. Google has also been putting ads into its AI summaries, but it's sort of unclear like what its strategy is there, if it's just moving ads sort of higher or not. Amazon seems to suddenly have its finger on the AI pulse in I think it was kind of behind for the last year. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it's really interesting to see them after kind of seemingly stalling for a bit on what directions and how they wanted to really like make a mark in the space to have them do this. Okay. And our number one retailer, number one, Walmart for opening a sneaker marketplace, which we talked about during our marketplace episode. So check that out if you haven't. And for making its New York Fashion Week debut. Ariel, say more. Is it a retail ranking without Walmart? (laughs) Yeah, so they're just like really pushing fashion um, in all sorts of directions. They 
were at Fashion Week, not the brand you would expect to see, but they, you know, did a pop up with designer Brandon Maxwell, who works with them on two of their private label apparel lines. They're launching a style tour, kind of an event across the country with curated styles and fashion tips. And then again, they're doing a partnership with resale site Stock X on sneakers. So they're really kind of doing a lot on fashion. And I just think it's a smart move considering, you know, it's got the grocery market pretty well cornered. You know, this is a way for it to kind of get people shopping for other items while they're in stores and getting them to buy just trendy products for less money. I think it's super interesting. I do think that it will take more for them to be known as a fashion destination, though. I mean, Brandon Maxwell, I guess he's known if you're like super into fashion, but he's not a big name the same way that Zach Posen is for Gap, Mm. for example. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I totally agree. I I think if Walmart, whose reputation is very much like set in stone for many, many consumers, is going to actually make big inroads into the space, they need to be doing these sorts of things. They need to be doing a whole lot of everything. Yeah. Because otherwise... People are just not going to associate this brand that forever they have thought of. It's just a place for like low cost stuff as a place to buy fashionable items. Yeah. I mean, Walmart has the money to take these kinds of risks. Every time we put this list together, Ariel, Becky and I are like, we don't want to put Amazon and Walmart at the top. They're always at the top. They're always on the list. But the truth is because of their flywheels, they just have money to take from other parts of their business and invest in these parts that aren't necessarily earning as much money. So they can succeed, or at least they can probably fund succeeding if they do it right. But it's hard to change your image. Okay, so that completes our list overview. Just to recap, we have number eight, J.C. Penney. Number seven, J. Crew. Number six, Levi's. Number five, Old Navy. Number four, H and M. Number three, Big Lots. Number two, Amazon. And number one, Walmart. As usual, we have a 9 and 10 that didn't make the list. There are honorable mentions. At 9, we had Thrive Market, which opened a retail media network in partnership with Instacart. And at 10, we had another bankrupt business, (laughs) Bed Bath & Beyond, which uh, launched a global licensing program for its brand. That was our first half. Now it is time for our second half. This is where Rachel and Zach will get to tell us where we went wrong. Each of them will have a chance to move a brand up or down our rankings list and to add a new company entirely. So, Zach, why don't you go first and make a move? Yeah, I'm going to yank Big Lots right out of (laughs) it, right out of that number three slot. I just think, like, if you have filed for bankruptcy in a month, you shouldn't be on a list of most interesting retailers. And... While I think it's notable that they are seeking to pull the holiday season into September, there are other retailers, notably Best Buy, who are also doing that and likely to find more success with it. And Best Buy is doing it with a hologram, so (laughs) there's that. But you're right. I mean, it's uh, not a particularly new thing for Big Lot to be, you know, doing uh, holiday sales, you know, ahead of the, quote, you know, traditional peak holiday season. So I'll allow the move. Zach, would you yank Big Lots to number eight or would you yank them all the way off and have Thrive move into that number eight position? I want to pull it all the way off and save a spot for my retailer. Okay, we'll do that for now. (laughs) Every time we do this, we, like, come up with new rules for how it it kind of functions. (laughs) Rachel, what is your move? We accepted Zach's. What's your move? Okay, so I'm going to go back to Old Navy, and I'm going to push them down the list a little bit. Um, As we said, you know, I think that it's an interesting move. It's definitely of the moment to play into this 90s nostalgia But I don't think that it's particularly unique. And I think that in the grand scheme of things for Old Navy and for Gap overall, it's not necessarily going to move the needle that much. So yeah, so that's my move. If Old Navy's moves down, that means like Levi's, J. Crew, J. C. Penney would move up. Do we think that they deserve that? I think that 
J. Crew definitely does. I mean, if we're talking about turnarounds, J. Crew is another brand that has done, I think, pretty well over the past year or so and just getting to that point where, you know, they're the it brand again. So I think that for the time being, in terms of interest level, I would say that, yes, it would go below the app and the catalog, maybe above JCPenney. I could be amenable to that. I definitely think that it's still interesting. I, I'm i still interested. But, you know, I think maybe it's not as interesting as, as you know, the Levi's or the J. Crew. Yeah, I'm I'm not moving it below JCPenney because JCPenney is also doing something as part of a greater trend, but I would move it below Levi's and J Crew. I also am interested in like how much this like Americana push will work now that the Olympics and like 4th of July season summer are over. That's when people buy their old navy American flag shirts. Obviously, the election is coming up and we've seen both sides lead- leaning into this like Americana vibe, but I don't know if that will inspire people to shop. Okay. We've pushed big lots off the list. We've pushed Old Navy down a few spots. We've been really amenable. I don't know if we're going to be as amenable. <laughs> I don't know if we'll be as am- amenable. Let's see. Let's see what you've got for us. Rachel, why don't you go first? What's your wild card and where do you want to put it? Sure. So my wild card is Zara. And I think I would put Zara pretty high on the list. I would say maybe above Levi's where it is on the current ranking. And that's for a few reasons. One is just that they're doing really well. Their sales are up like something like 11% in the five weeks up until the beginning of September. So people are really responding to their new collections. And they're also doing really interesting things to get new shoppers. They're going to start launching live streams in a couple of weeks. They're launching a resale platform in the U.S. in October. So I think overall, they're doing a really great job at reaching consumers, attracting consumers, and sort of pushing the envelope in bringing new people into the fold. Yeah. Um, (laughs) (laughs) You don't sound convinced. Zara, to me, is like another H&M, although I guess H&M is another Zara. Um, I could be convinced to add it to the list, especially above like JCPenney, which none of us have been super bullish on. But... I don't know that I would put it that high. I mean, Levi's app feels more new and different than what Zara is doing. Same with J. Crew's catalog. I would put Zara a bit lower. Yeah, I think I'm I'm okay with adding it to the list, but I might put it lower. I'm most interested in the live shopping part of things. I, you know, I'm super curious to see where that goes in the next, you know, year or so as people start to kind of you know, dip their toes into it. The resale thing, meh, everyone's doing that. But yeah, I think, you know, I would be okay putting it. I think we're, poor JCPenney, we're, we're putting everything above it. But <laughs> that's where I would put it is maybe, you know, above JCPenney or maybe Levi's. Fair enough. I'll take that. Okay. We'll put it above JCPenney. That kicks JCPenney down to our honorable mention section. Sorry, JCPenney. Zach, what's your wild card? Dick's Sporting Goods really crushed it in What did Q2. they do? They beat analysts' top and bottom line expectations. Comparable sales, I think they fold in online. Comparable sales rose 4.5%. That's up like from 2% a year earlier and like well ahead of the expectations. And What's interesting is that they're thriving at a time when a whole lot of athletic brands are struggling, whether you're talking about Lululemon or Nike or Under Armour for sure. And it just goes to show that they have a really solid game plan that they're executing really well. And they're doing it in a few different ways. They have built out a pretty solid private label apparel brand portfolio. And they've also brought in like really strong brands like uh, Hoka and On Running. And so they're just executing extremely well at a time when the category as a whole is in somewhat of a tough spot. Didn't they lower their outlook for Q3 or am I making that up? Uh, They did. It's still (laughs) decent, but... I I think that reflects like the broader retail environment and like I think just about like every retailer has 
like lowered their outlook. And, and that's because there's just so much uncertainty ahead with the presidential election, for one thing. So, yes, that is true, but I wouldn't hold that against them. I don't know. I'm not sold. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think that doing well is not the same always as being interesting. I think that there's times where we have retailers on this list where that overlaps, but I would like to see, you know, more of that, more of like, what are their partnerships? Like, I know you mentioned the Hoka and on running, which I do think is smart, but um, yeah, I'm just, I'm not sold that a 4.4 comparable sales increase is all that interesting. They're also broadening their store portfolio. So they're opening more experiential stores as well. And and that's part of what's driving some of this growth. But I think the notable thing is this contrast between, you know, Nike and Under Armour and Lululemon and all those brands that like just are not doing that well. And Dick's, which is. Yeah. Yeah. I hate to be that I'm I feel like I'm constantly this person. <laughs> That's okay. I'm also not convinced because this is so arbitrary, but we just put Zara at the bottom of the list. If we add dicks to the list, we kick Zara off. And I think Rachel made a better case. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I do too. I, that's okay with me. Um so I would give Dix an honorable mention spot, but I don't think that that's a a big enough sales lift. And I get that they're doing well compared to Nike and Lululemon. Those feel like really different retail models to me, though. Like Nike and Lululemon are brands that sell their own products and they sell expensive products. Dix is a big box store. It's somewhere you can go for cheap things. You said they're expanding experiential. They've also always been experiential, depending on how you want to define that. Like I think of Dick's Sporting Goods as a store that has a cool little track in it and maybe like a rock you can stand on when you're putting on hiking (laughs) shoes. So it has these draws that aren't necessarily new. I'll give it an honorable mention spot above JCPenney, but I will not add it to our top eight. I'll take it. Wait a second. There are two extra spots. We kicked both Big Lots and JCPenney off the list. We were sort of unconvinced by both of those. So, Zach, I will actually add Dick Sporting Goods to the bottom of the list. I do think that the good earnings are more interesting than JCPenney's moves. Okay, fantastic. And by its technicality. <laughs> so that leaves our list at, in our honorable mentions, we have Thrive Market and JCPenney. And then our new list is number eight, Dick's Sporting Goods, number seven, Zara, number six, Old Navy, number five, J. Crew, number four, Levi's, number three, H&M, number two, Amazon, and number one, Walmart. There you have it. That's our final list. I I think it's a pretty good one. Um, So thank you so much. Thanks for being here, Ariel. This is really fun. Thanks for being here, Zach. Yeah, thanks for having me. And thanks for making your Reimagining Retail debut, Rachel. Yeah, lots of fun. Thanks for having me. Thanks to our listeners and to Victoria, who edits the podcast and always checks my math on these lists. We'll be back next Wednesday with another episode of Reimagining Retail, an eMarketer podcast. And tomorrow, join Marcus for another episode of the Behind the Numbers Daily. 